With all due respect to the previous speakers, we're now going to hear from uh, people who I consider to be the real experts, and those are the patients. Um, we've got a, pa a panel of, of four patients uh, who are going to come up here. So um, I think what we'll do is, is have all four of you come up now. That would be Daryl Stufko, um, Joanne Wicker, Carrie Huber, and Mike Cunningham. So let's give these folks a round of applause. It takes uh, <laughs> takes a special kind of person, I think, to agree to do this kind of thing. So we might as well just we'll work down the line. If Joanne, you can go first. Okay. What I can tell you is Joanne used to be on our board of directors and uh, was uh, really instrumental in, in getting things going in Alberta, and we're really appreciative of that. Thanks. My name is Joanne Wicker, and I am a parent of a child with um, ZZ, type alpha 1. Um, and my real role in life is a mom, other than that, but I usually do children's programming, and so you guys scare me, because I usually work with kids 12 and under. And uh, I usually would get you to stand and do some songs and jiggle around, so uh, <laughs> if you feel like that, that's okay. You can. You can stand up and uh, wiggle around if you need a break there for, from my point of view. So go ahead. Hello there. I'm uh, Daryl Stufko. As you can see, I take my oxygen. I'm a ZZ. Uh, have been diagnosed oh, 12 years back. Of course, many of you who went through the system probably was misdiagnosed for quite a few years, which is seeming to be a norm from committees and education days that I've uh, been able to attend but um, yeah it's just uh, something you've still got to get some quality of life out of things and augmentation therapy does help me that way. Yeah. Hello. Mike Cunningham is my name. Um, uh, one of two people in my family that are both diagnosed as ZZ. Uh, I was diagnosed in 2007 but uh, I have an older sister was diagnosed many years before that so I kind of knew it was coming uh, in some respects and uh, she kept telling me to get uh, get tested get tested and I ignored her of course because she's my sister and that's what I always did uh, eventually it caught up to me and the, the symptoms started to kick in and they kicked in pretty quick and uh, when I ended up in hospital for a month lying in bed going well I probably should have got tested earlier but never did uh, since then, about three and a half years ago, I had a double lung transplant, and uh, things are good. Things are really good. Yeah, it uh, kind of changed my whole perspective on things. Uh, yeah. It's been quite an adventure. Hi, my name is Carrie Huber. Um, my son is lung affected. He's 10 years old. And so finally, we have a diagnosis compared to the um, hospital trips. In and out of the hospital, he emerged. And, um, you just got to get his asthma under control. You just got to get his asthma under control. So now we are under control with Dr. Super Beeler. Um, it's just interesting thinking back, the reason why we were probably diagnosed um, is probably because that little genetic piece of paper back on our file that I happened to say to a genetics colleague of mine, having my third child, Brady's our second, but having our third child, um, I work in the health unit with her. And I'm a dietitian, so what's the chances I have a lung-affected child when the only thing I understand is GI issues? Um, so I did ask her, I said, well, I don't have any um, family history of anything, but my uncle had a lung something. So thank goodness to her. Um, she connected, had me retested because my father was not a carrier 30 years ago, but he really probably was. Um, and then so had our third child, having that piece of paper on file for our son about eight years later, then we have a diagnosis because of that. Does, does anybody, I, I know you've, you've all got some unique parts of your stories. Does anybody want to sort of, now that you've introduced yourselves, you get on with, say some other things? I know Daryl does. Go on, you, Daryl. You go on. <laughs> well, basically, uh, uh, I like to have my freedom, so as I asked uh, Ben here earlier about this uh, self-infusion, 
which I do, and it gives you freedom. Uh, and I just find that it's a, it's a way to give yourself independence yet, to, you know, not always be chained down to wherever you're at. Uh, as far as uh, mixing and doing it yourself, it's, it's very simple. Uh, I do feel uh, for the people who do not have coverage for this uh, therapy of uh, infusions, those are the ones that we should be really trying to uh, get help for because it is very expensive and you know uh, I've been on it for 10 years and as I said to Jim a few years back I wrote a testament of what it has done for me which is you know slowed down the progression of the disease and still gave me quality of life and you know I will be shortly on that transplant plant list probably in a couple years time but my sister has uh, just undergone her second lung transplant. First time they did a uh, single lung, which I don't agree with, but it ended up being her bad lung that was still left in that was giving her all sorts of other problems. So yeah, last February she's underwent her second lung transplant. So hopefully now she's got two good lungs to carry on with. So, but I'm not ready yet. <laughs> maybe Mike, maybe you could talk about kind of making that decision because I know yeah. I talk to a lot of patients who um, they agonize over it for a long time. Uh, took me uh, uh, took me a long time to make the decision. I guess to get on the work up and, uh, and get on the list, so to speak. Uh, even right up to the the morning I got the call, I was still sort of backpedaling, mm -hmm. um, which they expect apparently because they call you back in ten minutes. Are you sure you want to? <laughs> opt out, go, okay, no, send me in. Um, there was kind of a, a wrinkle in the thing, but I'd gotten the call on a, on a Monday, and they found out after the, or I suppose uh, before the operation, that I, I had contracted the uh, H1N1 influenza. Uh, a few days before, ironically, while I was waiting in line to get the vaccine, uh, it was the, was the best guess is when I contracted it, so uh, there was a bit of a wrinkle I had to sort out, I suppose, heavy, heavy doses of Tamiflu, I understand, were, uh, were done, and that, uh, that program lasted for a while, before and after, and uh, oh, it seemed to work, okay, whatever, uh, whatever it is they did, but um, I offered, or offered, asked to be on the list, to get on the list, and of course you have to go through a workup, and even during that time, going to the workup, knowing that I'm going to be on the list, I thought, well, you know, I'll probably just deny it, but I'll go through this procedure anyway, just for the heck of it, and, and uh, yeah, sure enough, I'm, I'm kind of sure glad now, at least that uh, that I did go through that, got on the list, got the got the call a couple months, a um, couple months later, I got really lucky uh, time frame. Anyway, they told me it could be a couple of years, but I, apparently the perfect the perfect lungs came up. So uh, that's was another reason that convinced them to go through this Tammy flu thing and, and get over get over the H1N1. Um, wrote a paper about it and. Uh, from my perspective, finally, I'm number one because that was probably the first time they've ever done that uh, procedure to, to do a transplant with someone who already had H1N1. So I got to be number one at something, finally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's working for you. Sure is, yeah. yeah. No complications so far. Uh, you know, keep your fingers crossed, yeah. that type of thing. It's, work it's going really well, yeah. Take the medications, do the exercise, do what they tell you, basically. And uh, yeah, let's see. It's sure working good for me. It really How is. Long ago was it okay? uh, about three and a half years. Uh, November '09, mid November '09, when it happened, uh, was the perfect match apparently. Yeah, so they say, and that probably has a lot to do with it. Yeah, yeah, uh, What's I understand. Your activity level like now? Pretty good. I try to exercise pretty regularly, about three times a week. Uh, walk every day at least. Um, whatever I can, I I, I want to get involved in. Keep the cardio up, and the, you know the weight training, that sort of thing. So, good. push it a little bit. I already did it first. It got a little uh, something else they expect is that you get a little manic after after the transplant because you wake up one day and you can breathe and like the world's just a whole different place. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was actually getting medication to tone that 
manicness down. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you just want to get up and run, but of course you're hooked up to these big machines and stuff, and you can't, of course. So, um, <laughs> so at first I really pushed it, but I'm not sure. I guess the time will tell if that was a good idea to to push the walking, how much time you can walk and how much weight you can lift, that that type of thing. Uh, but it seems to work for me, so yeah, it's going really well. Pretty happy. Yeah. Good. Great team here at the at the U of A hospital. So. Are you on for last? No, no. Um, Were you on for last before lockdown? No, I never was. No, I didn't meet the. Uh, by the time I was officially diagnosed and my research at the time, I wouldn't have fit the criteria. I was below mm -hmm. the, the level of criteria. Your lung in you uh, at the hospital, I, I went in for a lung function test and came up with a. I think my FEV1 was about 12 mm. percent. Um, FVC was about 30. 28, sorry, about 28 percent. Yeah, so pretty, pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was getting pretty grim there at the end. Um, that I understand might have been another factor that they decided to go ahead with this perfect set of lungs. Showed up, all this might not come around for a while, and uh, it might not be there to uh, to be able to accept them. So, so they made the decision. Yeah, I'm pretty happy about it. Joanne or Carrie, did you want to say anything else before we? Kind of open it up to questions, which will probably end up being a, a kind of a good discussion, because really there's a whole bunch, a whole other patient panel out there of experts. I'm just curious: is there any other parents in the room of children with, like, young children? Yeah. Okay. Yay. Okay. Just wondering. I, this is the first time that I have been able to actually meet face to face with anyone that is Alpha One. So thank you guys for coming, it's great. Yes, I would echo that. It, it's nice to have um, the opportunity for the questions around the table and um, what I hear um, echoes to what I hear from my son, the clearing of the throat. And we didn't have much discussion today on the skin condition, but it, it's just, it, it, mm -hmm. it hits home when he's had two plastic surgeries on hit the bump on his face, which is fat accumulation, which relates. So, but the plastic surgeons explain that it's just um, a coincidence. It's not related. So maybe I'll find out more about that. Um, and Jim had put me in touch with somebody from BC. They are the only other diagnosed lung affected child in Canada. So what this does, knowing about um, Brady's diagnosis being S said. Um, in the school, I can kind of make the teacher be more aware that it's not a regular cold. It's, it's beneficial to not have that cold to build up his immune system. Somewhat build up his immune system, but still um, the benefit of the hand sanitizers and things in the school. So it's nice to have that information from Jim and be in contact with those parents so you have that basis of uh, things to use on a regular day to day. I, just so I, you know, I do have four children. I don't think I mentioned that. One of them is uh, ZZ, and the rest, we don't know. We haven't had the phenotype done yet. Um, we suspect one of them is a carrier, at least, but we're not sure about the others. So. I'd like to uh, say uh, it was about three years ago that... Um, Jim sent me an email there and asked if I wanted to go for a trip. And I thought he was kind of like, yeah, right. <laughs> Anyways, he uh, got me uh, to go to this uh, Griffel Center in Raleigh, North Carolina. And <clears throat> that was really eye-opening, especially uh, the biggest part of meeting all these other people with the same system as problems that I had. and people with other problems. And the biggest thing that all of us really got out of that was actually getting to meet all these donors. Because without the donors, you know, we were all in a pickle. So we, you know, to me that was the biggest part of that trip. And then also getting contacts for when I go stateside to get out of this weather. <laughs> And, you know, it's just uh, what I find with these conferences now, I've been to a few of them, and every time I come out of it, 
is something else. So, you know, we need to, you know, keep people informed and aware and, as they say, try to get more people involved because we know that there's a lot of other alphas out there that either don't know about it or, you know, as some people are saying, don't want to accept it. You know. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, are there any questions? There must be. My son is asymptomatic at this uh, point. Um, he doesn't have any symptoms. It was rather flukish that we found out he is ZZ. Um, so he is a pretty healthy, almost eight year old. Um, it's just good, I feel privileged to know at, at this point in his life I have, you know, I can tell him, hey, you, you know, you can't smoke, you can't do drugs, you can't do alcohol. It's not a bad thing for a parent to say to their kids. Um, so I feel very privileged and I really haven't had to do, uh, Carrie, maybe you can answer this one a little better than I can. Um, I've been just to the point of just trying to understand it. And so I appreciate the questions that our physician brought forward about the preventative side of the, of the therapy because um, he had mentioned that, you know, there is that possibility of maybe, I view it as almost instead of um, an ongoing treatment, maybe during flare-ups. And so it's looking at it preventatively. So I'm going to wait and watch and see where the research is going. I asked him, do you think it will be in our lifetime when that happens? And he said, I think so, right? Um, related to that, the other thing is um, campfires. So if anybody has a recommendation, um, we've uh, positively made the step from about nine eMERGE visits a year in prednisone and all those visits to now we don't even go to eMERGE and he's on the AA hockey team. Um, he, Jim recently posted his picture in the paper um, in the Alpha newsletter, he had put his birthday money. He didn't really want to give all his birthday money towards um, Alpha, but we explained, you know, being together with your, your friends playing and you'll still get a nice present from mom and dad anyways. So um, he then became more aware and um, explained to his friends why he had to be careful on the hockey team um, with all the germs going around and things like that. So that was um, how we had, you know, his input into the condition. Um, we're just going to wait and learn more about the therapy. That's all you can really do. Yeah, I think we, we, it sounds like a long time, but Alpha One was only identified. I mean, obviously it existed since the 1500s, but if not even before, um, it's only been 50 years since it was, uh, and that's not a long time. For, and because it's a rare disease, not a lot of money available for research um, in the beginning, at least, and so. We're learning new things all the time, and you know, whoops, sorry. You know, people talked about you know di different things that can be done with augmentation therapy, and of course, the folks from Griffles can only talk about what it says on the label, um, and you know that those are government regulations. Um, but there's a lot more research going on right now. Our, our American cousins have done just a phenomenal job of of raising money for research. Um, in the I think in the last I'm not sure how many years it is, maybe 10 years. Um, the uh, Alpha One Foundation in the United States has, has raised and contributed $40 million to, to research into, mm -hmm. into Alpha One. In the beginning, it was mostly the lung aspects. I mean, for a lot of different reasons, um, a lot of people who were only liver affected, um, and I mean that only as not lung as well, and not, not that it's, it's less serious. Um, they're starting to spend more and more, more and more of that money on, on, uh, on research into, uh, into the liver aspects of the disease. And that seems to be, I mean, that, you know, I mean, that's what it's all about, right? It's really a liver disease that affects your lungs. Um, and uh, um, they, a lot of that money has been, has been given to Canadian researchers who have been doing research. I mean, there's, um, there's a lot of them uh, more and more in Canada all the time and more and more in the States as well. So, you know, we could just, you know, we don't know when, but I mean, there there really is. Um, uh, there were two two studies released just just this month at the American Thoracic Society, um, fairly significant studies on uh, on augmentation therapy and whether or not it works. I mean, we're all pretty convinced that it does, but some of the some of the people who pay for drugs aren't. Um, I don't know if they're not convinced or just don't want to be convinced. 
Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of real exciting stuff going on. And I, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take. Nobody really knows how long it's going to take. But, um, uh, you know, we're getting there, slowly but surely. I mean, uh, I started working for Alpha One five years ago, and we had identified, um, I think, about 120 patients. We're now up to 566. So um, I think the medical community is starting to do a much, much better job of, of thinking of Alpha One and doing the testing. And, and, and you know, many of the governments are, are doing a much better job of making sure that the testing gets done. Um, we're making progress slowly, but we're making progress. And I think things look a whole lot better now than they did when, when I took this job. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's really hard to, the Canadian Thoracic Society has guidelines that say, you know, who, who should and shouldn't get it. And, you know, to, to make it really simple, you have to be fairly sick, but not too sick. So, so that, that sort of narrows it down. Um, it seems that it, it works best, doesn't seem to have a whole lot of effect if you've still got, a, you know, a good 60, 70, 80 percent of lung function left. And it doesn't seem to do any good if you get to the point where, where you ought to be on the transplant list. Um, so it's really hard to say. I mean, that's the thing about this this disorder is, is you know, and I, and I know I've already said it today, but you know, it, it's a lung disorder that or a genetic disorder that predisposes you to these, these two diseases, right? Or actually, the skin skin aspect as well. Um, so we don't. It's really hard to say. Um, there may be. There's probably patients out there who probably could benefit from it, but they don't know it. Neither does their doctor. Right, that they, they that or the medical coverage. And what? The prescription coverage. <clears throat> like yeah. I said, there's a lot of people out there that probably should be taking it, but, you know, it's again, we're up against the, the wall there with, you know, it, it's a costly drug. But there again, like uh, I've been on it for 10 years and haven't been in hospital for any reason have had my couple virus or, you know, colds or whatever there, but that's the whole thing is, is I really feel that if you can stay out of hospital, it's probably a cheaper expense than having to go the other way of having the uh, augmentation therapy. And so far with my uh, last test here on Thursday, over the last 10 years, actually 12 years, I've lost basically a percent a year. And that was a lot better than what it was before I started argumentation therapy, which was slid down pretty quick. Um, of coverage through Alberta Health and Wellness, that number of patients that we knew of who um, had been prescribed, or not, not prescribed, but... Um, Recommended. Sorry? Recommended. Recommended for treatment who were on a waiting list because they had no way of getting coverage has dramatically decreased. So I don't have numbers for you, but there, we knew that there was this pot, you know, a pocket of, of um, patients who were just unable to get treatment because of lack of coverage, but because of the, uh, the changes that came about as a, a result of Sandy's um, media coverage and so on, that number has, has reduced. So that's just wonderful, because I can tell you as an Ontario resident, the number of Ontario patients waiting for treatment who have no private insurance and, and no provincial coverage it's a, it's a really large and growing number, and it's really sad to see. Yeah, sometimes it's kind of hard to keep track of. In, in Ontario, when they stopped approving new patients, they did grandfather old, old pa patients who were already on the treatment continue to get it. Um, but when they, you know, we sort of, they, we knew that, you know, doctors had applied and, been, and, and the uh, patient had been denied. We got up to about 10 or 12, but then the doctors, they figured it out. They're saying, no, I'm not, you know, they stopped applying, so it's, we, we, you know, you really can't can't tell how many if how many people simply aren't applying because they know they're not going to get it. So it's hard to say. Well, uh, why don't we take our break then? <laughs> <laughs>